Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Preventing Decline. I got to tell you, I am so excited about this. I have been waiting weeks and weeks to get Brian Brown onto this show, right? Brian Brown is a neuronutritionist. I know you never heard of that before, but you're going to learn all about it. Dementia and aging specialist, cognitive scientist. Um, I, I guess if this were a few weeks from now, it would be Dr. Brian Down Brown. He's almost done with his dissertation. Uh, but Brian, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have this discussion about what it takes to prevent decline for older adults. It's a pleasure being here. And um, it is such an important discussion for us to have because we have the largest cohort of our population all within that age stratification of 65 and over. And we start to look at age-related diseases really start to escalate in terms of incidence. And of course, what we're talking about cognitive decline, we see things like Alzheimer's disease being the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and expected to skyrocket because of the aging cohort we're talking about. Yeah, right. Rates are rates of dementia are expected to triple in the next 25 years. I mean, that is disturbing, right? I would I would imagine here we are, right, with all this science, all this education, all this information that has allowed us to double our lifespan in yeah. the last 120 years. But what's the point if we're in decline for those last 20 to 30 years? And, and, and this is something that I always say, you know, we have extended longevity, but we've really done a poor job in looking at quality of life indicators to match the longevity and specifically what we're talking about this the the, the frontier of being cognitively sound which is the, the gold standard of going into uh older adulthood so let me ask you a question Let, let's start i'm going to make this one easy for you true or false dementia and alzheimer's are a normal and expected part of aging so that is the biggest falsehood. Uh, we know that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are part of an abnormal aging spectrum. And where, where people have been almost conditioned to think that uh, the, the eventuality of, of the sweet smell of dementia and Alzheimer's will befall us all is, is not true because it's not part of the normal aging spectrum. And so there's such misinformation about this and such fear that surrounds this with little to no answers and practitioners not in place to be able to really guide people to a proper aging process and how it looks and what we can do to reduce our risk for these diseases of aging. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for, for that. I mean, that's just a, a perfect explanation. If you don't mind, I'm going to throw two more at you. Okay. Sure. And, and you weren't ready for the quiz, but so far you're, you're batting a hundred here. <laughs> uh, number two, do people wake up one day is it one of those things where alzheimer's dementia it just like hits you one day like a virus or something so this is this is where a lot of people are confused we know research has told us that alzheimer's brain changes start 15 to 20 years before your first lost memory your first symptom of the disease and i want so to interrupt you for one second for sure. those of you listening, I want you to rewind and play back what he just said, which is the changes in the brain pre-symptomatic are 15 to 20 years before. Because we're going to circle back in a few minutes, Brian, about how that is really one of the most important windows for prevention and changing correct. your diet, your lifestyle. So we'll come back to that, but go ahead. That's, Sorry. That, that's correct. And so when we, when someone starts to show what we call the clinical symptoms for, for this, we know the preclinical symptoms, those 15 to 20 years before your first day of forgetfulness have started in that particular um, spectrum. But, but it is a progressive disease. It is not one that is instantaneous where you wake up and today you have Alzheimer's or related dementia. Boom, it hits you today, today, everything. It, it, it's not that disease. And so part of the lack of education, the lack of knowledge is that people don't know what they don't know. And, and all of a sudden, when they start to see themselves struggle in certain areas that they've always been proficient in, typically an adult child, 
or a spouse, someone who starts to notice these changes more, more focused, starts to question what's going on and may proclaim that something, something's not right and they start to ask questions. And really the question is, where are they getting those answers from in terms of what is going on? And that's that's a little bit of the, the conundrum that you and I face every day in terms of helping people on their path of looking at cognitive decline and what's normal versus abnormal. But to answer your question, you do not wake up tomorrow with Alzheimer's disease. And so I, I love what you're getting at, which is there's really this, this journey that people need to be aware of. And perhaps one of the most important, there's a number of definitions of dementia. It depends on who you ask, the neuropsychologist, the pathophysiologist, the yeah. neuronutritionist. At the end of the day, all the definitions start with a change in yeah. behavior, a change in memory, a change. It's a change. So when you see these changes happening in you or a loved one, that's when you know you should be concerned because it doesn't just change overnight. It's also a slow right. change, right? And so oftentimes, I know when I'm working with families, I'm typically asking about what is different, Right. Compare memory now to earlier. If you've got somebody who's always been forgetful, well, that's just the way they were. But if they were, you know, sharp as a tack and now have difficulty remembering, well, ah, now a light bulb should go off. Something's not right. Yeah. And, and, And that's why when looking at this, you have to take a holistic look at this. And this is why, you know, that family member, adult child or spouse or whatever we call the informant that we ask some pretty, pretty blunt questions to in terms of what we've seen over time and those types of changes. And and sometimes there's reasons for those changes. You know, we can talk about, man, they've been under extreme stress because of grief and other things that have precipitated some of these changes that we're seeing. But skilled practitioners are able to tease out and get a really holistic view of what's going on as opposed to the prognostication of, of, oh, you're just aging, just deal with it, and just sending them on their way, when there are really discernible reasons for some of the decline that we see. Now, here's here's the third one for you. True or false, dementia is potentially preventable. So here is, here's the, here's the, the literature and the, and the research. We have uh, enough robust research that talks about what we can do to reduce our risk for these diseases, these these types of dementias. Um, We can absolutely reduce our risk and look at putting off that delta, that change that we see to a much later stage in life where where we're looking at um, the longevity spectrum um, not be interrupted by these cognitive changes that we see. Look, is it is it fair to say? I want you to I want you to critique me now. It's okay. You can be as honest as you want to be, right? When I'm talking to patients, I'm typically telling them, look, in terms of your risk of developing dementia, 60% is sort of is sort of written in your genes. It's about your genetics, it's about your family history, but 40%, 40% of your risk is considered preventable, whether it be diet, whether it be, right, treating hearing loss is considered the number one modifiable factor, Uh, education, social isolation, depression. I mean, so so what do you think of that? So I would actually reverse those numbers. Okay. So so the the field of epigenetics will tell you that your epigenome changes over time, meaning that your genetic risk over a lifespan becomes less influential than your lifestyle risks. So so you actually have more control over these risk factors and the prevention than your genes will even indicate because over a life, our epigenome is influenced by those, those lifestyle changes. And so your numbers are actually too small for the lifetime um, changes. And so there's more impetus for people like us, practitioners like us, to actually influence the, the preventative aspect of these dementias and age-related diseases. Is it ever too late, though? So this is the this is the beautiful thing about understanding epigenetics. Any changes that you make today will start to pay off tomorrow. And so the to our 80-year-old person who believes right now my ship has already sailed, there's nothing I can do, 
the sweet smell of dementia is going to come on me because of my age or whatever. Now, age is the number one risk factor for it. However, any changes that you do now are potentially neuroprotective that will protect you in, in year 81, 82, 83, and therefore reduce your risk. And so anything that you can do is preferential than succumbing to this insidious disease. I, I love this because this is really the most important message, right? I think as a society, we're trained to think there's nothing we can do until there's a magic pill, yes. right? And and as you know, in the last few years, there have been major breakthroughs, especially in the field of Alzheimer's, in terms of developing drugs that can attack the plaques and the tangles in the brain, which is great. Yeah. But when patients come in to me and, and, you know, they have the newspaper article or they're all excited, I have to have that reality conversation of we're still decades away from these medicines having a very significant effect on the patient. Because right now they seem to extend memory maybe four to six months, which is what which is what the common Alzheimer's and dementia drugs do already. So it's a great start, but we're still many years away. And so we have to focus on these preventative factors yeah. now. Yeah, we, we have to work upstream. That's that's really the only way that we can we can start to, to really attack this particular set of diseases within the dementia spectrum. We have to go upstream. And and so you look at the targets of what upstream looks like, and it really boils around neuronal preservation because this is a race for us to, to preserve our neurons that are related to all of the functions, everything from our memory to our behaviors to all of those things are all um, brain-derived functions. And so our neurons, which get attacked during this um, dementia spectrum, specifically Alzheimer's disease, we have to look at neuroprotective techniques, which, uh, which then lead to all of these preventive strategies upstream that oftentimes, if you're looking for the magic pill, you're, you're, you're too late in the spectrum. And so this is where people like yourself and myself, when we see our patients and clients and so on and so forth, we're looking upstream at those neuroprotective modalities that allow people to maintain strong connections and uh, increase the bandwidth of the way that their brain functions. I, I love... I, I... I've never used it before. I, I'm just going to tell you right now, I will use it a lot after this conversation, neuronal preservation, right? Because that's ultimately, whether you're talking about hearing loss, yeah. dementia, whether you're talking about Parkinson's, multiple mechanism. sclerosis, these are progressive degenerative yeah. disorders for which the treatment right now is really about neuronal preservation. Yeah. Yep. So, so I, look, what I want to do is I want to, I want to like turn the focus now because this is great. And I think everybody's got a ton of information now. I want to focus on what you do, right? As the president of cognitive care management, and you're this neuronutritionist, which I'm just going to guess, no offense, 98% of people listening are like, what's that? So let's okay. start there. What is a neuronutritionist and how does that play into cognitive health? So, we know that everything you put in your mouth has a cause and an effect. Everything. And this is where a lot of people take for granted the routines of how they take in calories every day and, and, and preserve their life. Now, the science and the research of what perfuses our brains and our bodies to provide the right fuel, but also to function optimally. And in terms of neurodegenerative diseases, believe it or not, what you eat, what you drink, what you take in will tell the story of your risk for normal aging, if you're going to age normally, or your risk of developing abnormal aging through many of these diseases of aging, i.e. Alzheimer's and related dementias. And we treat non-pharmacologically. So we look at the body from a, the chemistry of, of nutrition and, and everything else in terms of me metabolism and things along those lines, and look at how your body 
is functioning currently, how your body was created to function optimally, and finding out what you're at risk most of, which will rob you of your ability to age normally and create the roadmap, the mapping, um, all science-based, everything like that, Every everything that we do, you will see objective measures in terms of where you are, where you need to be, and get people dialed in so that their body and brain are, are functioning flawlessly and perfusing uh, the, the, the right amount of oxygen and nutrients to the brain. And the most important thing that people don't understand is the brain is the most metabolic organ in their entire body. Approximately 30% of all the food energy you eat and 30% of all the oxygen that you breathe in go to power this very metabolic brain. And your brain is responsible for you. All of the decision making, everything that happens starts and ends in the brain. So if your brain is not operating in an optimal way, it puts itself at risk for diseases of aging and all of the other things that that can befall it. Uh, so it is not acting in a neuroprotective um, way. And so this is what I what I do it, it, that and and, you know, cognitive assessments and all of those types of things to really help people in their journey to, uh, to to age normally age well. But but I I so I get that and I got a nice sort of sneak peek preview of what your process looks like. But what does it mean to the to the average person who is just like I mean just tell them to eat better, eat more no, green, no, eat more like what no. I mean what is this about? I mean because it seems like it's something that should be simple to the mind yeah. diet, the Mediterranean diet, but I feel so, like you're so talking about diet. So, so that's the whole. So that's that's a, so diets diets um, don't work. Are, 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 <laughs> yeah, and so so we start going down. So for example, we start looking down and drilling down at things like gut health, which is that the epicenter of all of these things. You can eat as healthy as you want, but if your gut microbiome is not in tune, you cannot process. And you cannot take in any of those micronutrients to be uptaken into your circulatory system to be able to provide your brain and your body with what it needs. And so it means looking at an analysis of how, not just what, but how and when, and what are the delivery methods for all of these things to take place. So there's like five delivery methods and typically that we take in any type of, of uh, therapeutics and, and nutrition. You know, PO through the mouth, you can you take in all of that stuff that way, and you have to go through the gut when you do that. You look at things like sublingual, which is you know broken down and it goes and it gets digested through the through the, the gut and taken in there. Uh, you look at things like sub Q with with needles and and you can you can you can bring in certain aspects that way, and then you look at transdermal through the skin and you can deliver. Um, things that way. And then you look at intravenously. And each one of those ways has advantages and disadvantages depending on what we're doing and what we want to do. So we discuss all of those ways in, in barriers. As we age, things like our basal metabolic rate changes, meaning the rate that we burn calories. We oftentimes live in a world that we continue to eat what we've always eaten when we've eaten with the same amount of calories, even though our rate of burning those calories is slowed down with aging. So yeah, well, we you see that, right? You you see that. There's just a general trend. There's obviously always exceptions to the rule, but it, I feel like I heard somewhere there's this general principle of deal with it. After 40, you'll gain five to 10 pounds per decade. It is what um, it is. Yeah. So, so, so this is where we optimize people. <laughs> we optimize them, measure basal metabolic rates, make sure they're getting the optimal amount of calories, the right type of calories that will, will do it, the right delivery method of calories, making sure their gut microbiome is in a place where it is able to process those calories, making sure that we're ridding the body of toxins that will disrupt the mechanisms that will give you optimal chronic disease maintenance and, and, and freeing people of that and also you know optimal brain health. And so all of those things go into the big mix of understanding your neuronutrition risk for uh, a lot of these chronic diseases that are contributors to cognitive decline as well. So, so if you if you back way up, how do you understand someone's gut biodome? 
I think it was the word. Yeah, so their gut <laughs> microbiome. Yeah, the, the microbiome, microbiome. There you go. <laughs> There's a lot of tests that we can do. Stool sample. Okay. okay. We can do some blood tests to look at uh, your tolerances, your intolerances, allergies that you may be taking. And there's a lot of testing that we do to understand what's actually going on there. The acidity in your in your in your saliva. There's a lot of indicators that tell us what's working and what's not. And a lot of times, the culprit of inflammation and toxicity are the underpinnings to why we're going through these abnormal aging changes, abnormal brain changes. And they're oftentimes uncovered with these types of tests that we get to order to look really drill down to optimize people. And we are used to doing that. For example, let's say you go to your primary care physician for a regular physical, which oftentimes will not include any kind of cognitive assessment or anything like that. We know that's part of the problem. But one thing they do is they will draw blood and do the routine measures for the number one killer in America, which is heart disease. And so they'll draw, look at your triglycerides, your cholesterol, your HDL and LDL cholesterol, your homocysteine levels, all of those types of things. And then they would prognosticate that you are at X to, you know, X at risk for heart disease and so on and so forth. They go through their whole deal to try and optimize you in your heart health based on that. So what I do is sort of analogous in terms of looking at optimizing how your body functions with the fuel that it needs. What are you most at risk for in terms of your brain health and everything like that? And there's ways that we can look at and drill down to, to ensure that you are aging cognitively normal and lowering your risk for uh, diseases of aging and neurodegenerative diseases at the same time. Well, I got to tell you, Brian, I'm glad it's not just me who's gone and got blood work and thought, okay, heart, liver, thyroid. What about the rest of my body? Yeah. Like, yeah. Right, like there's so much more to this. There is. And so that's where so that's where you come in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 looking at that. And I, I love the ability to be able to educate my patients and clients. And that's that's the, the real sweet spot is because people people really do want to understand but our healthcare system is set up for failure where where it's there's not that piece where you can walk your your patient or client through to let them understand what is actually transpiring and, and the changes that need to occur which really will empower them to be more compliant really than than, uh, than yeah not. you're I don't get me started <laughs> right. Health care needs to be preventative medicine. Yes. It's not. Yes. Right. Where the health care in general is set up. Once you have a boo-boo, then yeah. we can fix you. Once yeah. you have yeah. a diagnosis, maybe we, we can give you a pill for it. But their preventative medicine is just not at the forefront of how we as a society operate. Correct. It is so reactive. And we've then conditioned all of the consumers to say the only time that the healthcare system is valuable is when something is dysfunctional, something's gone wrong. We've conditioned everybody to do that. We only visit the system when something's gone wrong. And as we know, by the, by the time that people start to demonstrate all of the signs and symptoms of any disease process, we are in an uphill reactive battle as opposed to getting in front of all of this. So, so let me ask you this, and, and we're starting to wrap up here. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for all yeah, of this pleasure. information. What I want to understand now is, because now I, I understand a bit about your, your diagnostic process, the education, fabulous. Talk to me about results. Talk to me about some of the patients oh, that yeah. you've worked with. I mean, lay that out for me, because it, even I'm trying to figure out when can I get to Phoenix and get my first appointment? <laughs> <laughs> so no, so that that that's that's what you say is so true because it is it is the the life change. This is the 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 I thought I was you know destined to this this basically this slow cognitive uh, life draining death um, that was on me because I you know I'm I'm not feeling as sharp as I used to and I just thought that you know it's it's here now and I'm going through this process 
to be able to optimize someone and educate them on what this journey looks like. And at the end of the day, you have the ability to live these robust, uh, meaningful, full of quality of uh, quality lives a- ahead of them. Yeah, it, it is one of those things that they then see the changes and then their colleagues uh, become clients and patients as well and family members. And, and specifically, when you start to see aging, aging adults who are starting to show those first indications that something is not right, there are adult children that are attached to them, that, that are part of the discussion when we're talking about their parents, they become patients and clients as well, because they see the changes that are happening in their parents and they say, I want to stay optimized and not even have to go through this. And so the feedback, the 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 ability to be able to do that has been tremendous. And so we're actually going into a phase where we are um, looking at creating a virtual aspect of our clinic so that we can reach people uh, outside of our brick and mortar. Because our brick and mortar is is wonderful, but it's also, I want to say, limiting. You know what I mean? So the world of telemedicine has allowed us to start to envision this. And so we are actually, um, within the next few months, going to be opening a virtual component of cognitive care management so that we can see people uh, around the country, uh, albeit around the world then, in terms of being able to engage them. in that is all- That is fantastic, right? Because that... You've got to do that, right? And please make sure I know I need to let everybody I know I about that. when that right. happens. Because look, I do actually come to Phoenix often enough, yep. but most people that's not really uh, an yeah. acceptable option, yeah. right? Yeah, no, it, it isn't. And we don't want it to be a barrier. And that, of that's course. where decision making comes, you know, that we really need to do a virtual version of this. And uh, and again, setting up the parameters where you can still get the blood work at any lab for Sonora Quest or any major lab close to you so we can still get those tests done and so on and so forth. But but it'll be just like we are here today, just like we're together. But we we're here, but we can be anywhere um, being able to do these types of consultations and really make a difference in the lives of Americans. I love that. I love that. And And again, I just... What kind of results do you see? I mean, you got a patient story or two to share? Oh, my goodness. So one of the one of the, the key things that people will will really come in for is this notorious brain fog where they just don't feel as sharp as they used to. Something is sort of impeding their ability to to have what they the mental clarity and the breakthroughs and things along those lines that are that are transpiring. So they they oftentimes come in and say, you know, I don't know what's going on. Um, and again, sometimes it'll be their their adult child or their spouse and say they're just not as clear. They're not focused. They talk about um, time it takes to retrieve certain certain processes and memories. Everything's slowing down. And so we start um, really drilling down. Success story: looking at their current medications and being able to determine whether there's a drug interaction and drug reaction going on with a lot of these medications that have caused their brain processing to slow down, as well as aspects of an inflammatory response in their body, which is then causing a whole lot of of cognitive issues. And so success stories means that we get to take people who either lower doses of their current medication, or in some cases, off of some certain medications, which has released them in ways that you couldn't imagine. We know that sleep is a major issue um, for a lot of people, which causes all sorts of issues upstream. We've been able to optimize people's ability to get the sleep cycles back in order to be able to do things. And all of a sudden we see new people. Their family members will say, oh my goodness, they're back, they're back. And that's the biggest you know, compliment that we can get is people saying, I have never felt this good, this sharp, this rested. You know, you can use any adjective you want to use to describe. And they become truly functional with a new re- renewed quality of life, which is exactly the gold standard. And so we get to see that in, in all of the levels. And that's what gives the, the great satisfaction is you get to see the discernible change and the lack of fear for the future. 
Because if you look statistically, for people over 60, the number one fear disease is Alzheimer's disease. So people over 60. Which is right, which is really right in line with the number one fear of losing independence. Yes, correct. Right? Due to. Yes. 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 So, so this hits that sweet spot is that we then get to provide education, treatment, and some answers for people in that big spectrum of fear in aging. And so what you do, I applaud you, you hit people because one of the largest pseudo dementias is hearing, you know, where where it can mask itself in these ways. And one of the big risk factors for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's is hearing. So you get to hit people right in that sweet spot. And you know, uh, God bless you, continue to educate um, other audiologists and hearing experts to let them understand that they have a tremendous opportunity to, to influence change and quality of life for people as they age. Couldn't ask for a better plug. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for your time today. I really hope you start showing up to work every day with a cape on. Because you, <laughs> my friend, are a superhero. You're a miracle worker. Being able to restore somebody's quality of life, there's nothing better. So thank you for all you do. God bless you too. And and I just, I appreciate you for being here. And I look forward to working with you more in the future. Likewise, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. 